My name's Joel Duff, and I want to spend a couple minutes talking about relative rock dating and how relative rock dating can provide us with powerful evidence for an ancient world. In this very picture, which is a picture of fossilized sand dunes in Utah, we see an example of how we can use relative rock dating to suggest that different layers of sediment were laid down at different times. So for example, we have a very clear line right here that demarcates these layers of sandstone or this sand dune that was laid down at some point here. You can see these layers are added up and then eventually you had some erosion of that sand dune and then later you had additional sand placed on it from a different direction, maybe a change in the wind direction and so the sand was placed at, a, at, a, at, a, at an interval of time later in time. So we know that all this sand wasn't placed at exactly the same moment in time, but proceeded to occur over different units of time, suggesting the passage of time in the formation of these particular dunes. All right? That wouldn't necessarily have to be a lot of time, but when we compare this to larger sections of the geological column, we then are confronted with a, a much more interesting puzzle that we have to piece together, and that includes uh, this cross-section of the Grand Canyon, which is a great example of using relative rock dating, where we'd say that at the bottom of the Grand Canyon you have these granites, uh, which represent uh, the oldest layers of rock, because those would have been present before you could have sandstone placed upon them. Then you have various forms of sedimentary rock that were laid down uh, on top of those, but at some point all of that rock got tilted, and in that tilting then you had erosion of those rock layers forming a new surface on top of which you had additional sedimentary layers uh, on top of those. And these sedimentary layers have different compositions which suggest that they were laid down under different conditions. And so all of this together paints a picture of uh, a series of historical events. Right? Historical events that couldn't have all occurred at instantaneously at one time, but rather had to occur in some progressive order. Right? So we call, that, we call this relative rock dating in that we can tell what the oldest segments of rock were, the, the original sediments, and then we can tell what the, the latest thing that happened in time uh, was. So that's great. We can use relative rock dating to give some idea of older versus younger sediments and it gives us a, a relative feeling for the passage of time. We don't necessarily know how much time exactly, to, uh, using just this method, we don't know how much time it took to lay down the Bright Angel Shale. But we do know the Bright Angel Shale was laid down at a time different from the Tapiz sandstone versus the Moave lime, limestone. Now, I want to. Uh, this is a, this is a famous example. I want to look at just a very simple cross section of a hill, and take the same approach and show how you could look at a variety of different places and be able to ask yourself what kind of historical events happened here, how much, and speculate how much time has passed in order for those historical events to have taken place. So let's look at this hillside right here. And we'll see that there's, a, there's an obvious difference in the uh, colors of the rocks. So we have this, this darker rock up here, and then we have this much lighter uh, rock below. That suggests that there's two different, at least two different time frames here, where we have uh, rock laid under one condition, uh, so it has a slightly different elemental composition, right? Its chemistry must be different in order for us to see it as being a different color. And then there was a later time in which rock above it was then placed that, or sand in this case, was placed above it that has turned into rock. But let's look, a, I can, we, let's dive into this just a little bit further. So we could say, all right, this lower layer of rock was first, right? And uh, what I'm not showing is a close-up of it. There's actually very fine layers of, of sediment in, in this particular layer. And then what we notice when we look at this rock is that it's fractured. So there's a lot of fine layers of sediments there in sedimentary rock, but then there are some large cracks that run through the sedimentary rock, and those cracks are filled with minerals. In fact, they're, they're a, a carbonite mineral which, is, uh, which appears white. And uh, so let me give you an example. So just a little bit away from this particular hill uh, on the surface of the ground of the rock here, we see that carbonate layer. So there's these white 
um, sections here are where this rock, which presumably was in place first, it had to be of laid down and, and formed rock, and then all of that rock was fractured or cracked, and then water seeping through those rocks eventually uh, precipitated out this carbonate material, which we look, which we see now as being white. And then in this particular picture, we'd say the history of this is that there was probably rock above this, right? And it's been eroded. In this other diagram, though, we see something a little bit more complex. complex. All right, so again, we said, hey, first you had to have all these sedimentary layers laid down. Then you had the rocks got cracked, and then water percolated through here, and you had the mineralization, or not the mineralization, you had the... Uh, um, you had these minerals uh, form in between these rocks. And then you see the, the layers of rock got tipped up 35 degrees. So that's what I'm trying to indicate to you is that these layers of rock are actually not horizontal. And yet the type of rock that it is suggests it was laid down in probably water uh, as some kind of sandstone. And so probably it was horizontal at one time. So the fact it's not horizontal now tells us there was a, a point in time after the rocks, after it turned to rock, after it had fractured, right, and then filled with the carbonates, then it got tilted up, then we had erosion of that rock. So the upper layers of this rock had to been eroded off. And so there's a very specific line here that represents the top of what then was the erosion point. And then at a point later in time, there was more deposition, right? So there was erosion at one time, the erosion stopped and then you had a period of deposition and this deposition is of these very, very, very fine layers that appear to be uh, wind-borne layers of sand that are then piled up on top which have now turned to rock. So we can go on and we can say that step number four or the historical event number four was the erosion uh, forming this unconformity and then we had the deposition of all of this additional sand, which actually has a, a basaltic origin or a volcanic origin uh, versus the type of material that's below. And that's why we see a difference uh, in the colors of those two. And then after all that happened, there was probably much more sand and rock on top of this. All of this had to be eroded. The whole hillside had to be eroded so that we could see now uh, this expression of these different layers of rock. All right, so all of this suggests the passage of, of some period of time, right? Um, if there's six different events here, um, some of them might have been relatively quick, maybe years, but probably still dozens of years or hundreds of years. And some of these events might have taken thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years or potentially millions of years. And I'm going to propose that uh, this actually, what you're viewing here, is actually more than a billion years of history which might sound rather outlandish, but I haven't told you one thing that's very important about this particular hillside. This particular hillside is not on Earth. We're actually looking at Mars, right? Yeah, this is Mars. Um, this might look like Death Valley or something like that, a non-vegetated uh, part of the world in the, in the desert. But this is a picture from the surface of Mars from the Curiosity rover. And what we see here is we see these hillsides. And in these hillsides, you can see that there is structure in here, right? There are, there are some kind of uh, various forms of sediments, um, uh, sedimentary layers in these hillsides. And what you're looking at as a hillside is you're actually looking at one of these lower hillsides right down here. So all of that history I was telling you about before, the six historical steps that had been taken to form that particular set of uh, exposed rock uh, is all just down here in these lower hills. But all of that is set in the stage of this much larger mountain range uh, in which we have a huge amount of erosion. In fact, I said that what was above that rock on that hill was probably a lot more rock. And the idea is that this whole area was probably filled with sediment, sedimentary rock, uh, possibly hundreds, many hundreds feet thick above the hillside you were looking at. So that's an enormous amount of erosion that's happened for you then to be able to see this particular rock exposed today. So where is this mountain that you're looking at right here? This mountain is actually at the center of a very large crater, which adds in another portion of our relative rock dating story. Right? Not only does one have to explain the different um, 
uh, features of that hillside that I showed you. But then you have to recognize that that hillside itself is found embedded and buried inside of a crater that was likely formed by a massive meteorite that ran into Mars. Uh, and so this whole thing is some 50 kilometers in diameter and there's this large mountain in the center and where you're at is right down here. Um, and this is where the, the Mars rover landed here and then has traveled across here to the base of this mountain and so essentially looking up at this segment. And it's thought that this was a large lake region and so the bottom part of that hill that you were looking at were fine layered sediments that were probably part of a shallow lake system. What's above it was uh, more uh, sands that were probably blown in and around and formed sand dunes above it that had been fossilized. And it's thought that this whole region was basically filled with those sand dunes, but since then there's been wind blowing around through here that has carved out a lot of that rock, resulting in the hills that we see today. So this was all filled in with rock at some point, and then wind has carved all of these hills and valleys uh, since that point. There's no evidence of any water flow in here. There's no water carving uh, of these particular mountains. All right, so if we pull back out, here's that crater, and you are right over here. Uh, and if we pull even farther out, we can see that Gale Crater is just one of many craters on Mars. So now let's add to our story of the history uh, of how relative rock dating and looking at layers of rocks can expose the fact that worlds have very ancient histories. Uh, and this ancient history of Mars is that a long time ago, there was a enormous crater formed and there's many many other craters as well. After that crater formed you then had a lake form that then had to deposit these different layers of sedimentary layers and then you had that lake dry up and you have a variety of different sands that filled up a large portion of this lake and then later in the history you had uh, a much more, uh, probably a greater amount of wind in this part of, of Mars, which has then gradually been carving out the rock that was laid down before. Remember, you had to lay down all that sand and all that so forth. It had to sit there long enough in order to become rock, all right? It had to cement together, that takes time. And then you have to have erosion and all that erosion taking place by wind. So what is the conventional time scale here? The, the, the time scale, it's thought that the, the crater and the lake and the deposition inside of sands inside of that lake took, oh, took place well over two billion years ago. And that what you're seeing in front of you in this picture is well over a billion years of wind erosion um, to create the scene that you're seeing now. So we could say that Mars is a massive rock sculpture, all right, produced from winds over billions of years. Now this is quite the challenge. Uh, the reason I actually uh, did this video is because um, young Earth creationists would claim that uh, features like the Grand Canyon were formed in a very short period of time, right, over the space of less than a year during a global flood, right, all the deposition of all those different layers. Uh, and so any kind of uh, relative rock dating to them is uh, is, well, it's rather difficult to do, but also they kind of compress all those different dates into a short period of time, saying that all these different layers were formed very, very quickly over time. And so I'm trying to turn that on its head by saying, look, you can apply that same logic to this other hill, but this hill is actually part of Mars. Did Mars experience a global flood as well? And if it experienced a global flood, how would it have created these craters inside of a crater having a lake, a lake that then has multiple different types of sedimentary rock in it, uh, which then was carved by wind with no evidence of massive amounts of water doing any of the carving here. Wind takes a long time, an extremely long time, to have the same effect that water does on, on uh, rock material. Uh, and so Mars really speaks out and speaks to us of a world that is extremely ancient and has taken a long time to form into the way that it looks today. All right, so that's a relative rock dating and uh, evidence of an ancient world, in this case, the ancient world of Mars.